Welcome to the uh, Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee. Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call the remote meeting of the House of Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee to order. The CLA will take the roll to determine which members are present. Please say present when your name is called. Chair Bernardi. Present. Vice Chair Christensen. Present. Representative O'Neill. Present. Representative Albright. Present. Representative Daniels. Present. Representative Erickson. Present. Representative Hansen. Representative Hansen. Representative Heinzman. Representative Heinzman. Representative Howard. Representative Keeler. Present. Representative Cleborne. Present. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kresha. Representative Kresha. Representative Mason. Representative Mason. Representative Meckland. Kosnick is present. Representative Meckland. Representative Noor. Present. Representative Sandell. Present. Representative Sandstead. Present. And Representative Thompson. Present. Representative Heitzman, present. Representative Becklin present. Mason present. Okay, we'll try that again. I will, uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 20th, 2021? I would make that I motion, make Madam. That motion. Okay, we got Representative Heinzman, thank you. Representative Heinzman moves approval of the minutes for January 20th, 2021. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes for January 20th, 2021 are approved. And we do have a quorum. Today we have a presentation from the University of Minnesota who will be giving us an overview of their legislative priorities for this year. We have several presenters today, starting with our uh, President Ga Joan Gable. President D Gable, welcome back to our committee. You may proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Chair Bernardi, uh, Ranking Member O'Neill, members of the committee, committee staff. It is lovely to be with all of you today on this beautiful winter day. Um, I also want to recognize any members of the university's Board of Regents who are joining us remotely, as well as our student leaders who are joining us. Um, and I'll introduce the ones who are presenting to you in just a few moments who will be sharing some comments. Um, I also want to recognize and acknowledge my colleagues who are joining us, Myron Franz, who of course you all know, Julie Toninson and J.D. Burton. They are all on the call as well. Members of the committee, I'm looking forward to talking with you about what's going on at the U and also broadly about what's going on in higher education here and around the country. Since starting in the summer of 2019, I've been really grateful to have the opportunity to engage with all of you and your legislative colleagues in St. Paul. And in some cases before things shut down last year to meet you in your hometowns, meet your neighbors and your constituents and discuss in person and now over Zoom, how the university affects your community, where we can improve what the future should hold. 
And in these and so many other ways, we're really grateful for your support and all that you do for the University of Minnesota, including most recently how our bonding recommendations were received last session. This significant investment in HEPR, which is an investment in our infrastructure and in our infrastructure of the state, is something we're really honored to be able to distribute. Um, it's allowing us to do design funding for a clinical research facility, for our undergraduate chemistry teaching lab on the Twin Cities campus. It offers full funding for the A.B. Anderson building on the Duluth campus and funding for the child development building on the Twin Cities campus. These are programs and buildings that will be even more important when we come through the pandemic, not only because of the research that they do, but because of the type of instruction that they offer in areas that are so critical to the state. You also made other critical investments, such as the full support of, our, of the legislature for our COVID funding last year to ramp up testing in partnership with Mayo. And we saw how that came together so importantly on behalf of the state. So in these and in so many other ways, we really enjoy working together to further the success of our students, to further the success of our citizens, but also to advance our longstanding partnership and really think about how we work together. Members of the committee, I'm only the 17th president of the University of Minnesota, an institution whose legacy stretches almost 170 years. And from a governance point of view, we are governed by a 12 member board of regents that are elected by you, the legislature, that represent our eight congressional districts across the state and four at large seats. I serve as the president of the university system and I'm also the head of the Twin Cities campus, but I'm joined as you can see here by an outstanding group of chancellors that lead our other campuses across the state. They are wonderful partners and friends and advocates for the state of Minnesota who are deeply committed to their work on their campus and then how all of this pulls together as a system so that we can work together on behalf of the entire state of Minnesota. Members of the committee, this service on behalf of the state of Minnesota is what we're about. We are a world-class institution, but we have a deep legacy of our sense of place in this state. It's why I wanted to be here. It's what some of you have heard me talk about since I was a candidate for this position. But I do wanna clarify what I mean when I say that we are world-class with a sense of place. What I mean by that is that we are committed to and exist to serve our state, but we are also committed to do so at world-class levels. We're really proud to be a community of 26,000 employees who serve 68,000 students with a $4.2 billion budget that allows us to make something we're very proud of, a $9 billion yearly economic impact, which extends and is created by all five of our campuses, from Crookston to Duluth, to Morris and Rochester, and of course, to right here in the Twin Cities. It's also across every county in the state through our extension program. And in a way also leads our adorable mascots that bring a smile to everyone everywhere they go. So uh, tell me you didn't smile when you saw that picture. So I'm very proud of how this work together fulfills our commitments, starting of course with student success. So this fall, the University of Minnesota system had some challenges, but there was good news that I wanna share with you. We enrolled the largest class of Minnesota freshmen and the highest percentage of students of color in over half a century. Our four-year graduation rate on the Twin Cities campus is the third highest amongst Big Ten universities. We're also deeply committed to how we do discovery, innovation, and how that work creates impact all across the state. We rank in the top 10 nationally in research and amongst the top 20 in the country for patent creation. And despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, we exceeded a billion dollars in research and development expenditures for the first time in history. And to be clear what that money means, that means money came in from outside of the state of Minnesota into the state of Minnesota to invest in research that is undertaken and that creates products, applied solutions, cures, and discoveries, and reflects the work of our faculty, staff, and students, and our partners here. All the while, that work has been targeted, especially of late, towards developing cures and treatments. And since the pandemic, that work has pivoted largely to life-saving vaccines and therapeutics, development and increasing COVID testing capacity, and inventing low-cost ventilators. We have over 20 different clinical trials going on on campus right now, all of which demonstrate the value created for all Minnesotans and beyond has never been higher. 
We've treated over 3,600 COVID patients, and we have the lowest mortality rate, as far as we know, in the country in that treatment. This was all developed, all of this success through the research of our faculty in partnership with industry and the health systems and in partnership with all of you. And this all comes together to reflect a commitment to advance a community and a culture where a sense of belonging is strong, accessibility is valued and prioritized and equity and inclusion are promoted. We're also very committed to fiscal stewardship. I know this is an area that you all take very seriously and I want you to know that we do too. We are cultivating efficiency and transparency by initiating long range planning and establishing administrative cost benchmarks. We presented that benchmark to you last year and reported that we are doing well, better than we used to, but that we still have work to do and that we're committed to bringing down our costs and finding savings so that we can be affordable as four year choice for Minnesota families. It shows in some of our numbers with undergraduate students on all of our campuses with debt loads well below the Minnesota state average. And I'm very proud to work with our team and leaders like you who really believe in and support the power of this education, the investment that this education represents from the first thousand days of life and the work and research we do there to that first post-grad job, which we're very committed to making sure our students are fully prepared for. You really see this, I think, if I may, reflected in a way that I'm very grateful for, that we've captured in our first ever system-wide strategic plan, which we call MPAC 2025. This effort to prepare the strategic plan continued through the pandemic and benefited greatly from broad consultation across our entire university community, the wide range of stakeholders that we partner with, including you all members of the legislature and the administration. And it was inspired by the state of Minnesota because it reflects our commitment to world-class research, teaching, and service undertaken in the spirit of our mission, particularly our land-grant mission, to equitably create access and innovation at home, but with global impact. The core of the strategic plan is found at the intersection of our values as an institution and how we also take action. And at that intersection of our values and action is our commitments. And it's why we use the word commitment to describe what we intend to do in this plan. I wanna highlight one of those commitments, the one in the center that we call mentor sections. And as many of you have heard me say before, I felt like we couldn't write a plan that didn't have MN in there somewhere. And so that is where we put it because I want it to be really clear that if you put your hand over the logo of this strategic plan, you would know that it is the plan of the University of Minnesota for Minnesota. So the mentor section's commitment is very specific to us, our state, your research institution, and how we find the intersection between the core strengths, the questions posed by our state, the unique challenges and opportunities it poses, and how that may evolve and our strengths as an institution and where we think we can make the biggest contribution on behalf of the state. So we start our strategic plan emphasizing health, sustainability in our natural environment, and then food and ag, because we see the very deep intersection here between the robust questions and opportunities that occur and emerge in the state of Minnesota and the strengths and talents and service, student curiosity, faculty research, commercial partnerships of the University of Minnesota across all of our campuses, and then what we can bring to the table to be of service before you in philanthropy, in our research, in our teaching to unlock our collective potential. It's a unique contribution that only higher education can make. And as we align the work that we do with the strengths of the university, we think we can be the best university of Minnesota. So going from the commitments under the action items, we're now prepared to bring forward to our board a refreshed university progress card. This is the metrics. This is how we hold ourselves accountable. This will come before the board in February with a dashboard for everyone to be able to see our results. We want to be transparent about what we're accomplishing. We want to be transparent about where we can improve. So alongside established metrics that we've had for some time and that really predate the strategic plan around diversity, enrollment, lowering student debt, We've added new metrics around lowering administrative overhead, establishing a tuition-free program for students with the greatest need, increasing the number of online opportunities so that we learn the best lessons from these challenging times we find ourselves in, among others. 
We're also extremely focused on efforts to advance a community and culture where a sense of belonging is strong and accessibility is valued and equity and diversity are promoted. To this end, and through the community and belonging commitment of MPAC 2025, we are actively increasing representation across all campuses and programs so that we can create a climate where our BIPOC students feel welcomed on campus and are provided the resources and support networks to succeed. We're looking at how we partner with K through 12 and other systems early so that we can create opportunity that is never a mystery so that all students can see the University of Minnesota and higher education in general, frankly, as a place for them. I'm also pleased to update you on our deepened relationships and engagement between the university and Minnesota's tribal nations, including hiring our first ever senior director of American Indian tribal nations at, for the University of Minnesota system and our first ever formal meeting with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. We've also been confronting critical questions about justice and accountability in relation to George Floyd's tragic death on May 25th. We have a lot of work to do in this space. We acknowledge that, but we are committed to a shared voice around this work and to applying our expertise and resources and passion and abilities to drive action that's sustained and meaningful towards a collectively safe campus for everyone. In fact, while I've been reporting to you, we released the report prepared by our external reviewer on our university policing that looks at the real tension between the desire for safety and how the police contribute and the desire to feel safe where policing can be viewed as a challenge and how we intend to move forward through that space to inclusively create a safe campus for everyone. Importantly, for our purposes today, our new system-wide strategic plan is guiding the choices we make when we set the budget framework for the university. This framework really reflects our priorities, our needs, and also our strategic planning underway to keep the University of Minnesota's land-grant research institution active, useful, meaningful, while also being affordable and accessible for all Minnesotans. So members of the committee, as a result of COVID-19, Obviously, the university has experienced some, we'll just call them interesting times, but we did act quickly and proactively to make sure that our students could successfully progress through their courses um, and proceed towards graduation, which is obviously where we want them to be, with as little disruption as possible as a result of the pandemic. We wanted to support our faculty and staff, and so we replied, we, excuse me, we relied on a combination of federal CARES Act funding the use of university reserves and balances, and then some quick steps to lower our expenditures to address shortfalls prior to the end of the last fiscal year. The total of the shortfalls addressed in the first four months was about $65 million, which you see on the slide before you. Due to challenging fiscal environments students and families face under the pandemic, the university held fiscal year 2021 undergraduate and graduate tuition rates flat along with most of the professional programs. We held those flat too. We also froze all of our fees. So everything we're doing to address our shortfall is being done internally and not on the backs of students. To hold next fiscal year's expenses down, the university continued or implemented a few different things that I wanna to call to your attention. We implemented a hiring freeze. We froze merit salaries, which we had already booked in the budget. So while that's cost avoidance, it was a savings for us. We implemented an incentivized retirement incentive option that you may not be surprised to hear had a much higher uptake than similar efforts have had in the past. We had a system-wide furlough and pay reduction for all university employees with the highest paid employees taking the biggest cuts or most days furloughed, depending on which category they fell into. We are continuing to access reserves and implement internal budget expense reductions and reallocations to keep everything sustainable through the year. And we're also being innovative. We don't wanna waste the crisis to help bring our costs down. So these are tough times. Every one of us has had to tighten our belts and we are certainly not immune from that. And we're committed to doing this as much or more than everyone else has to as part of our service to the state. We put safety first, student affordability next, preparedness and support for the state's COVID response, and now we're on our way. We all can see the light at the end of the tunnel to whatever our new normal is once we're all safely able to be together again. So we're not here to seek your assistance in addressing our deficit. We consider that our responsibility, but as we pivot ahead, we are focused on how we co-invest in the future, in the recovery, in the new economy, 
and everything that comes after the pandemic. So members of the committee, the biennial budget request we bring before you today is about the next chapter of the institution and the next chapter of our state, which are so closely intertwined. The university's fiscal year 2022-2023 biennial budget request is in one category, O&M or operations and maintenance funding. Specifically, we request a $15.5 million increase over our base for fiscal year 2022, and then an additional $30.1 million for fiscal year 2023. That totals $46.5 million. It is the lowest biennial budget request by the university in over 20 years. It is straightforward. It reflects what we hope is a co-investment in how the university serves the state, how the university is a partner to the state, it also reflects our understanding for and appreciation for the challenges associated with setting a budget in very constrained times and with very limited resources. We are also bringing forward a $264 million capital request focused on building off of last session's bonding bill and driving resources to asset preservation and STEM education. HEPER, of course, sits at the forefront, touching all of our campuses and field stations, with the exception of our Rochester campus, where we do not own any of the facilities. HEPER resources are key to keeping a warm, safe, and accessible campus for all of our students, faculty, and staff. The second piece you see here is to complete the chemistry undergraduate teaching lab on the Twin Cities campus. This builds off of the design funding that you approved last year. Thousands of students take chemistry courses and we have a backlog in lab space and our labs are old school. They are literally from the 30s, not the 2020s. And every single student who goes into every field, clinical care, innovation, science, discovery, ag takes chemistry and we want them in the most modern space that they can possibly be in. And we are also requesting funding to complete the pre-design and design for renovation of the science building in Duluth that many of you know is the old chemistry building for exactly the same reasons. The state funded the new Heikola Chemistry and Advanced Materials Science Building in 2017, an amazing modern replacement space for many of the functions that were in the old chemistry building. This project would allow the old space to support the anticipated variety of STEM functions and for the courses that would pipeline into the kind of work that we're able to do in the new Heikola space. So we can share more information with you about that soon. So members of the committee, ultimately, an investment in our budget and our capital request is an investment in the future. It's an investment in accessibility and affordability for Minnesota's tens of thousands of students who will become our workforce ready graduates, our state, our corporate partners, and society need and deserve. In fact, each year, our graduating class adds nearly $200 million in annual earnings to the state economy. Our alumni currently living in Minnesota contribute more than a quarter trillion dollars in impact to the state. This allows us to co-invest in discovery, research, cures, and treatments by our world-class faculty, clinicians, and researchers that transform the state and our economy. It's an investment in COVID-19 breakthroughs. It's transformational in allowing us to bring in over a billion dollars of investment in our research to the creation of things like the biotechnology hub called Biomade that you might have heard about recently in the news. This was a US Department of Defense investment here in the Manufacturing Innovation Institute that will be in St. Paul. It allows us to quickly commercialize ideas, seek intellectual property patents. We had a record number of startups last year, even in the pandemic. Startup companies are the future. It's where the new job growth will happen. And it allows us to fulfill our service mission to be a better future for Minnesotans through knowledge and expertise and training and our shared commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And lastly, in tying this all together, it's an investment in the strategic plan, which you all contribute to greatly, which benefited so much from your input. And I hope you see yourselves and the feedback that you gave us reflected in there. And now joining us, um, I have some students that I would like to introduce to you because I know you'd probably rather hear from them. So I will start uh, with a welcome for Ben um, Raumanowski, who will tell us uh, about why the U of M and his experience on the Rochester campus matters to him. So with your permission, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Ben. Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Romanos Romanowski. You may proceed. Hello. Hello, yeah, so I am Ben Romanowski. I am the, the current president of the Rochester Student Association. Um, so I am originally from a small town in Northern Pennsylvania, Sayre, Pennsylvania. I, it, 
town was very similar set up to Rochester. It was built same as kind of around a hospital, similar to how Rochester was built around the Mayo Clinic. So due to the situation, most of my family got into healthcare. And then about four and a half years ago, my family moved to Rochester, mainly for the Mayo Clinic, but for a variety of other reasons also. So after moving to Rochester, uh, my family ha went through a few health issues and I was able to see just how really amazing the Mayo Clinic really was and how healthcare can make a huge impact on people's lives. Um, and so see, being able to see that and experience the Mayo Clinic and what they do, um, that led me to pursue a career in healthcare. Specifically, I wanted to go into biomedical engineering. So um, I started working toward a career in healthcare um, through starting to take classes, college classes at, R at RCTC, Rochester Community Technical College, I, in my junior and senior year of high school for the PSEO program. Uh, RCTC was a relatively traditional school. So when I started at the University of Minnesota Rochester, I was really able to appreciate just how unique and amazing UMR really was. Uh, during my time at UMR, I uh, have been able to experience our you know, flipped classroom style as well as take advantage of some of the connections and relationship we have with Mayo Clinic and use uh, features such as Just Ask that we offer uh, to really experience, with, in my opinion, one of the best educational settings. Um, so uh, in our flipped classrooms, uh, I have been able to apply what I learn in the course, as well as um, learn practical skills, such as presenting in front of a group and working as a team to find solutions to problems. Also, one of my favorite things about UMR is our Just Ask Hours, in which professors, they come to student common rooms, so students are able to have easy access to the professors to ask about anything and everything. Um, I feel this is a really important part of UMR because it has allowed me to create relationships with my professors and create a learning envir environment that's not just in classrooms, but outside the classroom as well. Um, through this, I've actually had the chance to do a directed study, uh, which I was able to do a one-on-one -on -one class with one of my professors to learn more about a specific part of physics I, I found interesting. Uh, just another one of the benefits that come to with the Just Ask uh, um, feature that we have at UMR. So um, I think one of the most important things about UMR is our relationship with the Mayo Clinic. Uh, due to this connection and relationship to the Mayo Clinic, I uh, ha was able to start doing research in a neurology lab at the Mayo Clinic by the end of my first semester, um, and I had no prior research experience before then. Uh, and I think that one of the experiences I had there really encompasses what I feel you, the experience at UMR Mayo Clinic is like. So at my very first meeting with my PI at the lab, um, he, one of the very first questions he asked me was, what am I interested in? And what did I wanna learn through this experience? He then followed that question by telling me that I'm not here just to observe, but actually to learn about research and, uh, and uh, learn about neurology. So I think it really encompasses what UMR is about because UMR is really about learning. Uh, and from the moment I started UMR, even in the connections with Mayo Clinic and the community is obvious to me that education and learning was the goal of UMR. Um, almost all my professors at one point or another have said that you no know, grades are important, but learning is more important. That's what we're here for. Uh, that is what UMR is all about. It's about collaboration between students, faculty, admin and administration to create the best learning environment. Um, I've also had the privilege to be part of the RSA uh, and, and to see how the administration at UMR interacts with students. And as with the rest of UMR, it's about collaboration. From the day one, from, from day one when I started, administration reached out to the RSA to make sure that student voices were being heard in all aspects of UMR and it's continued all the way through COVID um, and till today. Um, beyond the educational aspect of UMR, life at UMR is also an amazing experience. Uh, at UMR, we have a very small uh, class sizes and how our classes are set up, students, we really work a, a lot in groups together in class as well as outside of class, which allows us to create great relationships with each other and a tight-knit community that has helped support me throughout my entire time at UMR. Um, our small size and tight-knit community really create a great university environment, but really what makes the experience at UMR unique and outstanding is our ability and willingness to collaborate not only with UMR, but with the Mayo Clinic and the community to create an educational experience you will find, I, I don't know where else you'd find it, it's really amazing. So my current plan um, is to graduate next spring uh, with a bachelor's in health science. And then I'm planning on pursuing a PhD in bioinformatics and computational biology uh, through the University of Minnesota. Um, after that, I am planning to stay at the Mayo Clinic, uh, but I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna work out after that. Uh, this kind of brings me back to what I said earlier, and you might have noticed that I originally said I was interested in biomedical engineering. I think that's one of the amazing things about, uh, about UMR, is that UMR allows you to explore your options and explore careers. So even though when I started, I was interested in biomedical engineering, um, I had an idea of what biomedical, biomedical engineering looked like in my head in the medical field, but through the experience I was able to have at UMR, 
Uh, I've actually changed what I wanted to do multiple times now until I finally settled upon uh, bioinformatics and computational biology. So um, it wasn't for you, Omar. Um, I would have probably went through my entire career and got to the end of bio, uh, biomedical engineering and wouldn't have really noticed, uh, wouldn't have really been nothing that really fit me the best. Uh, and so I think it's having the ability to explore careers like you are able to at UMR and see how they really work in the real world is really priceless and has helped me to ensure that I find the career that was right for me. So uh, in conclusion, it is uh, important to invest in the University of Minnesota because we are providing a unique and um, amazing university experience that revolves around relationships and collaboration to create the best environment to learn and to live. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, President Gable. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Ben. So next, Chair Bernardi, uh, with your permission, I'd like to introduce a student from our Duluth campus, Megan Keating. Welcome to the committee, um, Ms. Keating. You may proceed. Chair Bernardi, members of the committee, and President Gable, thank you for allowing me time to provide testimony today. My name is Megan Keating. I am from Prior Lake, Minnesota, home district to Representative Albright, and I'm currently a senior at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I'm on track to graduate this May with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a minor in early childhood studies. Next fall, I'm hoping to pursue a master's degree in the social work field in hopes of becoming a grief specialist. I am a proud first-generation college student, and my parents have always supported and encouraged higher education for me. When I was touring different colleges in high school, there were many campuses I was interested in, but none stood out to me quite like UMD. The campus, the faculty, and the upbeat, positive environment all made it feel like my new home away from home. Receiving my acceptance letter in the mail from UMD was truly one of the most exciting days of my life. Even though it seems hard for me to believe today, my family and friends know that I struggled somewhat during my freshman year. The adjustment to, college, to the college experience brought many challenges, but I'm so thankful for all the support I received. From my RA to my freshman seminar instructor, my supportive faculty and my sorority advisor and sisters. I can honestly say you to tell you that I would not be here today without the many resources and people who make UMD so much more than just an in-class experience. Flash forward three and a half years to where I am now, I have grown so much as a student and as a person. And this is largely due to my wonderful experience at UMD. Here I am with the opportunity to be in front of you telling my story. Freshman Megan would never have imagined what almost graduate Megan has become. A student's first year of college are important because this is when they begin to establish themselves as an independent person. Some choose to do this by joining an organization, continuing their athletic career, working on campus, conducting research with faculty, or any number of other experiences outside of the classroom. While there is no definitive example of a typical University of Minnesota student, I feel as though my own experience is representative of the types of experiences other students have at our universe, university. My freshman year, I joined Gamma Sigma Sigma, UMD's national service sorority. I make connections with students who shared the same interests as me, and we attended programs and events with one another. I had the opportunity to take on various leadership roles, with, which eventually led me to serving as our organization's president for the past two years. The connections I have made through this campus involvement, as well as interacting with faculty and staff inside and outside of class, have led to additional opportunities for me. Volunteer roles, paid student employment, paraprofessional roles, and currently an internship that is preparing me for my career in social work. I'll be frank with you, I do not know very much about how the university's budget and revenues are calculated. But I do know this, the funding that makes the, so many university resources available is invaluable to my success and the success of my university peers. This has been made ever apparent during the COVID era. I will not take for granted my opportunity to interact with my faculty, to meet with my amazing advisors, to talk with the staff in our careers office, to seek help from financial aid, to learn, learn alongside a, diver, a diversity of students and on and on. I trust this committee has a hand in making all of that and more possible for the students at the University of Minnesota. And for that, I say thank you. And please know that I see firsthand every day how your investment is paying off. Oops, okay, we're gonna do a pause here. And I see Representative O'Neill has her hand up. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple questions really briefly for the president. And if she could turn to slide 17, it would be easier to take a look. And 
then once and then once we um, do this question, we have one more testifier, and then we will move into um, questions by committee members, just to let everyone know. Thank you, um, President Gabler. Since this is, we've got a lot of new uh, members on this committee. If we look at the bottom where it says O and M, and you have 602.8 million, but you have ST specials at 68 million. Could you just let us know what does SD specials, what is that and what is comprised in the 68 million per year for that? Um, President Gable. Chair Bernardi, uh, Representative Neal, it's nice to receive your question, thank you. Those are state specials and I will defer to um, ADP Julie Tonnenson to walk you through those details. Ms. Tonnenson. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I have my mute off, yes. Uh, we actually receive, these are general fund state specials uh, that are specified in law where they have to go within the University of Minnesota. So we have an agricultural state special that goes to Minnesota Extension Service and the Agricultural Experiment Station. We have a health sciences state special where there are um, a multitude that go to the uh, veterinary diagnostic lab, the medical school. They're spelled out in terms of where, where those funds have to go. There is a um, it's called Institute of Technology special that goes to two programs within the College of Science and Engineering, again specified in law. And then there is something called the system special, which is a mixture of miscellaneous items that are specified throughout the university where they have to go. Uh, some to Duluth, that's where the NRRI appropriation is, for example, uh, some on the Twin Cities campus. So that's without going into multitude of, of detail on each one of them, that is in general what is in that line. Representative Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that answer. Um, maybe at some point when you come back and present, you can get you can present us with some of that uh, base detail. I know that in times past and when I've been on this committee before, that detail wasn't really offered. We would get presentations about specific projects that um, that you wanted funded, like brain research, brain stimulation research and different things, uh, that would be helpful. And then the last question I have is, with the OMN, spend, excuse me, O&M spending a six into $602 million, what would be some examples of what you would spend that on? I know it kind of goes into your general fund, and so that's really hard to determine because you have $4.2 billion of an annual budget. So $602 million of a 400, it's a $4.2 billion budget um, makes it hard for us to kind of track through to see where that money goes. But if you can give a little bit of an overview, small, just some examples of where that money goes for the, the new members of the committee. Ms. Tonneson. Yes, uh, Chair Bernardi, uh, Representative O'Neill, that is literally spread throughout the institution. So examples would include it funds all or portions of faculty salaries, it funds equipment purchases, it funds uh, for research and for instruction, it funds utility costs, it funds uh, uh, you know, compliance activities related to uh, providing services for dis disabled students. Uh, it literally goes throughout the institution across all of our activities, all of our colleges, all of our campuses, all receive portions of that money and it is general considered general operating dollars uh, at that level. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. And so it's just good for the committee to understand that the OMA and money is kind of spread all over. So um, this, the money that we provide to the University of Minnesota is found throughout the entire system, even though it's only a 4.2 billion dollar budget, you know, ours is 602 of the 4.2 billion and um, it's pervasive throughout. I think the only exception might be some of the NIH grant money is not commingled. Would that be accurate? Yes, uh, Chair Bernardi. Ms. Tonneson. Yeah, Chair Bernardi, Representative O'Neill, that's correct. We don't commingle the funds. We have a lot of re restricted dollars on top of our, our sponsored grants from the federal government or foundations and so forth. We also have gift income, we have sales income, we have clinical income, all those different sources of funds are tracked separately and are not commingled 
so to speak, with the state money, but they come together to support uh, different units in different ways. So it, it is a very coordinated budget in that regard that they coordinate with each other, but the state money does go, there is an amount of state money of O&M dollars in every one of our colleges that supplements the other income that they generate. Representative O'Neill. Okay, I think Representative O'Neill is done with her questions. Um, we're gonna go back to President Gable with the remainder of our presentation. Please introduce our next guest and I will welcome them as well. Thank you, Chair Bernardi. I'm pleased to introduce from our Morris campus, Delaney Anderson. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Anderson. And you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Minogiji Gad Niji and Shinata Gigwich and Dana Manidu Waba Menigug Nungum Uju Delaney Nindijlikaz Nagachi Wanong Nindunjma Ajijak Nodem. Good afternoon. My name is Delaney Anderson. I'm a student at the University of Minnesota Morris and I come from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa in Minnesota. I'm a currently a third year uh, psychology and human services double major with a sub plan in social justice and a minor in Native American, American studies, excuse me. Um, I chose the University of Minnesota Morris because of its indigenous support and tight knit community. Um, it's a place or it's a bit of a culture shock going from a place where you're surrounded by family and people that you know to living in a place where you don't really know anyone. I struggled being so I struggled being so far away from home. Um, from my home community this year, or my first year, excuse me. Um, and I didn't have a community when I first got here um, and it took some time and some struggling, um, but I was finally able to uh, find my own community and that community turned out to be just as close as my home community. I've made friends through various clubs and I know that I, that I will keep them for a lifetime. Um, and I've been able to use my experience to mentor other incoming first year indigenous students uh, through the NAS and TRIO programs on campus who might be sharing struggles that I once had. Um, I know that I'm not the only one who has gone to Morris and felt the strong sense of community. My older sisters went to Morris about 10 years ago um, and when they couldn't come home for Thanksgiving because they were on call for um, their RA uh, position, my family brought Thanksgiving to them. Um, we made food in the dorm hall kitchens and laid it out on one of the pool tables. My sisters invited all of the international students that were there over break and other students that couldn't make it home for that holiday. And it was a great experience watching my family members and um, the, my friends and my sister's friends, as well as um, other students that were there over break, get along and laugh with the other students. Additionally, I've been able to learn a lot about my indigenous culture that I don't think I could have learned anywhere else. The, the University of Minnesota Morris has allowed me to learn cultural practices that I wasn't able to learn um, at home through their auntie in residence programming. Um, this program is where an elder woman from surrounding indigenous communities have come in and taught us to feed, make moccasins, as well as other traditional teachings. This has given me and my family the chance to connect to our cultural roots. And there's something so profound about learning um, my indigenous language and about my indigenous history on the grounds of a boarding school that sought to erase indigenous identity in the past. Miigwech, Bizindayawig. Thank you for listening. Miigwech. Um, President Gable. Chair Bernardi, Chimigwech Delaney, thank you, Ben and Megan, for your presentations. And thank you, members of the committee. Um, are nearly 70,000 students across the system. Um, these are wonderful ambassadors for the work that we're doing. So I want to extend uh, my sincere appreciation on behalf of the entire system, including our students, for the opportunity to be with you today and to engage in my first biennial budget request to talk about our partnership focused on the future of the state and express our appreciation for everything you do for the University of Minnesota. So with that, Madam Chair, I conclude my remarks and I'm happy to take any additional questions. Thank you, President Gable, for your presentation today. And thank you to the students. It was, it was very moving testimony. So anyway, members, we have a representative new, uh, uh, rep okay, just one second. My, um, 
and video went. Okay, so we're going to start with Representative Keeler and then Representative Noor. Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delaney Chimigwich Pidame, I appreciate you sharing your story in this space. Um, it's a story that we need to hear, we need to see, and we need um, to take into consideration as we're making decisions. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of all of the students here who shared their stories. My question, President Gable, is about the resources that Delaney talked about um, and how important it is that we intertwine culture uh, with higher education. And I know that we do that at Morris because of the history with the boarding schools, but can you talk to me and others a little bit about how we're implementing that across the whole U? I know that you mentioned that you hired a senior director. Um, maybe some of that is taking place, but language, culture, um, being able to see yourself through representation is extremely important to not only get into higher ed, but to be successful, retain and graduate from higher ed. Thank you. President Gable. Chair Bernardi, uh, Representative Keeler, 100% agree. Uh, we are uh, working really hard to take some of the best practices from Morris and think about what that means around the system, not only for the benefit of student success, which is the cornerstone, but also as part of our commitment uh, to being um, aware and acknowledging our complicated history and thinking about how we can learn from each other, um, find the right intersections between indigenous wisdom and more traditional university scholarly research and how that can create deeper understanding, um, how we can be inclusive in our instruction uh, so that not only can you learn about culture and learn language, but also not hear things that might actually be factually incorrect. The example that I heard uh, from a friend when I first started my own journey here upon arrival was about understanding astrology, for example, and understanding the um, depth of history and lesson from the European perspective versus the ancient understanding that we have through the work and wisdom of the, the indigenous nations here. Um, and all of that is coming together in a really focused way. So our relationship with our tribal community partners is called out specifically in the system-wide strategic plan. So we make an overall commitment to our neighborhoods, our partners, our friends, our BIPOC students, but we also understand the unique nature of the political status of our 11 sovereign nations and what that means specifically for education, research, partnership, and collaboration, and our framing out our work uh, to reflect that those unique attributes. Representative Keeler. Thank you, I appreciate that. I do have one quick follow-up when it comes to our students and supporting them in universities like um, Morris. One thing I know is, um, I think it was a couple years ago, there was a shop co there and now it's gone. And so like one thing is, you know, where do our kids go when they have food insecurities and have supports that it's one thing in, in the U when you're in the middle of Minneapolis, St. Paul, but some of those extension spaces, you know, we're in a pandemic. We know that kids are struggling. We know that families are struggling. Um, what kind of services are you providing then for those students who are out on some of those smaller campuses that the community is falling apart um, and like to get anywhere is, is a good 45 minute drive and some kids don't have cars. President Gable. Uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative Keeler, we have food, a different level of food pantry support on each campus, either by the campus or in partnership with the county or other community partners. We could get you a report that shows what we're doing around the system for food and housing insecurity. If you'd like some of that detail, we'd be happy to share it. Yeah, that would be great. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, glad to see you. Uh, although COVID-19 has prevented us from seeing each other because uh, I'm neighbor to the University of Minnesota. In fact, I always say it's every neighborhood surrounding the University of Minnesota is in my district. So uh, good to see you today. I just have a few questions. Uh, the first question is in regards to the highest number of students of color. Uh, in more than half a century. Is there any report that can help us and guide us and give us by the numbers uh, where the students are coming from and their backgrounds? President Gable. Uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative Nora, it's very nice to see you too. Uh, I, we can get that for you in detail. It is um, largely from within the state of Minnesota, obviously, because the national trend that you've heard about in the media about students staying closer to home during the pandemic has been true here too, we're very glad to report. And uh, so you're seeing, it, 
it would be what your instincts are probably telling you that it is, but we'll get you the detail so that you can see it. Madam Chair. Uh, Madam President, uh, the other question in regards, you know, mentioned COVID-19 and students staying close to their homes. How much has the international student uh, impacted the uh, University of Minnesota, those who are unable to come to the campuses now that we're in a pandemic? President Gable. Madam Chair, Representative Noor, a lot. <laughs> that would be the scientific assessment. So nationally, international student uh, participation in higher education in the United States is way down. And uh, that is a, a multifaceted challenge for us. So we serve um, the citizens of Minnesota, but we think we serve them well by offering them cross-cultural competency, which having an infusion of students from around the world and from other states as part of the educational experience, we think is a wonderful way to support. And so we're concerned about that absence and what that means. And of course, um, international students are part of the revenue model um, to the extent that tuition is a significant portion of our revenue, our international and out-of-state students generally pay more in order to allow our Minnesota students to pay less. And so um, their absence is felt uh, we're working very closely with our international partners so that um, students last year who couldn't come by virtue of safety or immigration issues now can. Of course, changes in federal restrictions um, that have happened in the last few days should help. Vaccination distribution will help. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but in this interim period, it is way down. Representative Noor. Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you so much, Madam President. I just also wanted to thank you for your leadership. Um, not only in the uh, space of the academics and everything else, but also on the issue of uh, you know, conducting a review of the public safety. I uh, always look for a process whereby we can imagine safety beyond policing uh, because the, the U of M police are around uh, my neighborhoods and everywhere else. I look forward to reading the report and making sure that the neighborhood surrounding the University of Minnesota are aware of uh, the changes that are taking place at the U. So thank you so much and thank you so much for your leadership. And to the students, thank you so much for sharing uh, your stories and we look forward to continued support of the University of Minnesota. Uh, rep thank you, Representative Heinzman. And then I have Representative O'Neill on deck. Thank Representative you, Heinzman. Uh, first, I wanna start out by thanking you, uh, Madam President, for being here today. Um, we, we've had uh, some pretty good conversations so far, and uh, I'm going to give you a heads up. I don't have any softballs. I have some more uh, uh, pointed questions, uh, but it's not at all meant to uh, bring the conversation down. It's just there's, of course, uh, another side of the coin when it comes to a budget, when it comes to some moral issues and such. And, uh, you know, people are watching our committee today and wondering, you know, uh, how some of those uh, questions might be responded to. And I'll just start off with a budget. I'm sure there'll be more questions about this issue, but uh, I've, I've had the, the, uh, the opportunity to serve on this committee since 2015. And so I've been watching and participating in this conversation for quite a while. Um, in previous presidencies, there was uh, some, some uh, pretty strategic effort to uh, cut costs at the university. And I think that if I uh, took the information correctly while watching the governor's uh, budget presentation today, I think that he includes a, a pretty generous increase to the budget at the University of Minnesota. If I am looking correctly, I think uh, $56 million in additional revenues. Um, I'm not going to say one way or another if that's right or wrong. I do think that it should be considered in the context of the fact that we are seeing a shortfall, and this would be the first session that I've seen that as a member of the Minnesota House of Representatives since 2015, as I mentioned earlier. So this is a change. And so I'm wondering, uh, considering the effort that was made in previous administrations, and I'm talking about the University of Minnesota level, to reduce costs uh, by, and it was, it was pretty ambitious, hundreds of millions, if I recall correctly, and uh, the administrative departments throughout the university, what your plan might be. And uh, uh, it's, I think, uh, a little bit optimistic to expect to see a increase during the shortfall. So if you do see a decrease in funding, 
How would that be handled and what would you be doing to protect students? That's my first question. And then I'll have a follow-up Madam Chair after that. Rep, um, President Gable. Um, Chair Bernardi, Representative Heitzman, uh, I understand exactly where you're coming from. These are extremely challenging times. Um, we're very grateful, obviously, for the governor's support of our request in his budget, and we're hopeful for um, how the uh, university will fare during these challenging times. This is why, though, we've made the lowest request that we've made in a generation is a reflection of those challenging times. And it's also why um, we're doing a lot of work internally to handle our own shortfall in the short term, the ones that are coming directly from the pandemic to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, and also what we're doing in the long term. So we are continuing the previous efforts of my predecessor to do the internal reallocations uh, in order to reduce administrative overhead. And we benchmarked that last year and saw that we had come from the higher end of our peer group, to the middle of our peer group, which is good, right? It's progress. We want to be in the lower end of our peer group, and there's still some work to do to get us there. And so what we're doing now is uh, bringing in external help to help us find where we can cut costs and also create some operational efficiency across the system. This is a big part of the work that we're asking Myron to lead now that he's joined our team, is how to find that kind of operational administrative efficiency beyond what we were able to find on our own. So we've been doing this work for several years. It's continued since the leadership transition. And now we're looking for how we have to look outside of what has worked for us in the past and dig even deeper into our overhead costs. Um, if we are unable to um, receive support from the state, the, we have the main things that fill our budget are our people and um, the programs that we offer to students. We're very committed to not having this come at the expense of students and what they pay. We have an internal standard of not raising tuition above inflation that pre-existed the pandemic. This was a statement I made in my first days on the job. So if tuition goes up, it would be um, only at the smallest levels, it wouldn't be how we would solve this problem. It wouldn't be enough to solve this problem. And what it would mean is that the program launches, the strategic investments that we want to make for the future would either be delayed or tabled. And um, that concerns us because we think that's how we are partnered in the future economy, but it would be, um, it would not be on the backs of students and student tuition. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just respond that I noticed that uh, Lead O'Neill was sharpening her pencil and taking some notes during your comments, Madam President. So I am assuming she'll continue to have questions relative to the budget. And I will tell you that I'm somewhat disappointed not hearing hard uh, strategies. I'm glad that uh, uh, Mr. Franz, Byron Franz will be there to maybe assist with that. Um, but I do hope that a more specific strategy can be discussed publicly soon. Um, I think that it would have been great to have that today. So I, I have to tell you, it's a bit of a disappointment to me personally, but um, uh, like I said, uh, Lead O'Neill will probably have some more questions along those lines. My, my, my second question um, is on a, a moral question. And if you look at uh, some of the statistics gathered around the issue of abortion and around that question, uh, there's some that would suggest that a majority of Minnesotans have strong feelings on an issue of life. And uh, I see you grabbing notes there, so I'm glad, Mr. Madam President, that you uh, have some uh, that information hopefully available, expecting a question relative to this issue in aborted fetal tissue research. Uh, it's been an ongoing question. I mentioned I've been here since 2015, and it's been a question that uh, started long before I arrived. And uh, I think the goal should be that uh, we, we should definitely taking a, uh, a cost benefit approach to this issue and in the hopes that uh, we could eliminate fetal tissue research at the University of Minnesota medical campus. Uh, I think there's other options and that's a long conversation we can maybe have in another time uh, at another time, but uh, I'll just ask if there are continued efforts and I have a number of letters here from years and years of asking this question. Uh, there was effort to try and uh, uh, utilize other sources uh, of material for research that has previously required uh, aborted fetal tissue. And I'm just hoping to hear that uh, that 
that uh, can be eliminated in, in your time as president and we can use, utilize those other sources for materials as opposed, as opposed to aborted humans. So that's controversial. I understand that not everybody's gonna appreciate the question, but I'm bringing it up because I, I do know that a very large amount of Minnesotans do care about this issue and they wanna hear your answer. President Gable. Chair Bernardi, Representative Heinzman, thank you for the question. I understand this is uh, a question of great importance to many of um, to many Minnesotans and many of your constituents, and we take it very seriously too. Everything we do in this space is governed by statute, um, including um, transparency around the work that we're doing and a commitment that any research that we do undertake that involves fetal tissue, that we've explored every possible option for alternative ways in which to do that research. Um, before we would uh, uh, engage in any research that involves those materials. Um, we only have two projects that were to be disclosed um, this year, all in the report um, that is required by statute, which we have already provided. The first um, was research on Zika, um, and that research is complete. And the second uh, is um, uh, has not um, been undertaken yet. So those there are no active projects at this moment. Um, I wanna mention that the Office of the Legislative Auditor um, released a special review of fetal tissue research and um, it found that other than one small change which added the requirement of a date on a form that had been just human error left off, um, they uh, uh, concluded that um, we had been in full compliance with all of the requirements that the state asks of us in this space. And we're fully committed to continuing to operate transparently and in full compliance in that way. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just end with a comment. Um, I'm somewhat disappointed, Madam uh, President. Uh, I would like to hear that there is uh, ongoing effort to eliminate the use of aborted fetal tissue in research at the University of Minnesota. Uh, but I'm glad you're willing to come and talk about it. You deserve credit for that. And I do thank you also for reaching out earlier and uh, I don't know, a week or a week and a half ago, uh, offering to meet with uh, members with some of these questions. And I will take you up on that and hopefully we'll have the opportunity this session to discuss some of the more sensitive questions in private and uh, uh, glad that we could talk about this publicly uh, in spite of my uh, disappointment. Uh, I think I've made my, my point and I'm glad we're uh, able to have some more conversations. So I'll yield my time. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Gabler. Um, I have a couple questions again, just so that the committee kind of gets up to speed about the U. You're very complex. And so you're a very big institution. You've got a lot of facets through Minnesota. But one thing I think would be really interesting <clears throat> to the committee would be if you could speak just a little bit about the medical school, uh, how much of your budget that is, or how much does that comprise of the U, and your relationship, whether it be in competition or collaboration with Mayo. I know you have Fairview system, and so if you could speak to what's different between the Fairview system versus the Mayo system, um, and how much the medical school comprises of the university and its budget. And then I have one follow-up, if, if you would allow me, Madam Chair. Thank you. President Gable. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative O'Neill. So on average, one out of every $6 goes to um, the medical school. Broadly speaking, in the training they provide, the research that they do, and in support of the clinical care and the innovations we do in clinical care. So it's the medical school broadly, which includes the training of clinicians in their doctoral programs. So it's a very significant investment. Our, our, um, we, we train 70 to 80% of the clinicians in the state of Minnesota, and we um, do a lot of research around discovering cures, which I referred to earlier. Uh, the Fairview partnership is the cornerstone partnership, of course, and it's the partnership um, around M Health Fairview, which has created um, the clinical care uh, around the state that you see the Block M um, um, so closely and apparently connected to. But we partner with virtually every health system in the state in different ways. So in some, to some extent, there is, I would call it healthy competition between the different healthcare systems. 
that um, everyone would like every patient to be their patient. So to that extent, we compete, I suppose, but we also collaborate a lot on research. You heard our Rochester student talk about the collaboration in that part of the state around instruction, which we're um, increasing. Our chancellor down there, Lori Carroll, has a bluff top plan to grow the work that we do down there, which would be of direct benefit to the partnership with Mayo, but also to all of the healthcare systems that employ her graduates. And there's a lot of collaboration in service to the state, which you've seen most notably in our joint effort around testing um, that we would argue is the best testing program in the country right now. Representative O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, President Gabler, the next question is unrelated to that, but it's the Alumni Association. And um, is the Alumni Association funded by the University of Minnesota budget? And if it is, how much is uh, allocated per year for that? President Gable. Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, I don't know the exact number. Uh, Julie Tonnenson may know off the top of her head knowing her, but if not, we could easily provide that to you. They do receive some support from the university, yes. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that'd be great to get that number. Uh, just one of those little, um, so it'll probably be in the media pretty soon because I've been asked a lot of questions about it, but the uh, the Alumni Association and their, their role in the region selection is becoming an issue. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's important for this committee to understand that the Alumni Association is at least in part funded by the University of Minnesota. And as, um, different uh, advocates speak on behalf of who they would like to see as a region. I think it's important to know um, the connections between all of that, between the Alumni Association and, and how they're actually funded by the administration. And okay, um, and I think actually Representative Heinzman got to most of the questions I was going to ask. So I'll leave it at that. And I see there's a couple more. And, and Madam Chair, um, do you have another presentation after this or is this the conclusion of the presentations and the rest of it's left for discussion just so that we have a sense of the landscape? It's uh, the rest is for member questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question is um, specifically around the Natural Resource Research Institute in Duluth. And Coleraine, and I see the president shaking her head yes already. Um, could you speak a little bit of the funding that the university receives? How much is currently going to NRRI? And then the follow up for that would be as I watched your presentation on intersections, um, I see there being far more opportunity uh, to really develop this. As I've talked to different uh, people regarding the university, uh, staff within the university, everybody calls NRI the best kept secret, but I guess I'm wondering why is it a secret anymore? I mean, we should really be, I think, using this um, statewide and it's it's got global attention. It has the attention of other states and I feel very strongly that we could be doing much more with this. President Gable. Yes, uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative Pinson. So yes, uh, I'm nodding and smiling because I uh, totally agree. And I'll let, I'll get the, I'll have JD get the exact dollar amount to you, um, which I not surprisingly don't know off the top of my head, but the, um, there are regular um, opportunities for legislators to tour NRI. And when we can do that again, I really encourage all of you to go up there. Uh, it is a fascinating um, research uh, space um, that sits within um, an old military building and it just looks like uh, what would one would imagine a mid-century military building would look like from the outside you walk in and it's just this sort of aha of incredible innovation around natural resources and in particular freshwater although not exclusively they do tremendous work on um, forestry and and mining and um, after mining and, and just all kinds of um, questions that are so critically important to the state of Minnesota and where we, much like the Minter sections commitment is intended to capture, have the best opportunity to answer those questions for others that also would love to have the robustness of the natural resource opportunities that we have. And so why NRRI is not better known is um, somewhat of a mystery to me. 
um, as I've come in from the outside and learned about it. I knew about it before I got here. I know more about it now, obviously. Um, and it does seem as if um, it is in some ways better known by others who do research in the space than by the, you know, the person you would stop on the street to say, hey, have you ever heard of this? And so we've done a lot of work around um, branding and understanding the role that the university plays in the lives of Minnesotans. And you may have seen some of those commercials often emphasize natural resources and the work that we do around freshwater invasive species, forestry, et cetera, agri-food, clinical care, the things that really have meaning in the daily lives of people around the state. Um, and we need to do more to make sure that the brand of NRRI as part of the university is more visible with that. But that's a little bit of a branding mystery to me that uh, we're very committed to and, and very much support, but would, we would like to solve that too. Representative Stansted. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then uh, President Gable, do you have any recommendations? Um, it seems my understanding of the funding for the university as a whole, they'll receive you know, a large dollar amount, um, not, not taking into account a state special, which is really spelled out what the purposes are for. How could, how could we improve like base funding for um, an initiative like this or this kind of research instead of being in competition, like it seems counterintuitive, uh -huh. counterproductive for the university to be competing with itself basically for its own funding, basically how they're going to use it, where they're going to put it. President Gable. Um, Chair Bernardi, Representative Sanson, yes. Uh, in, to some degree, we set up a little bit of internal competition on purpose because it inspires a lot of the innovation, it keeps people accountable, it creates the transparency that we expect. So a little bit of it, we actually encourage, but when it gets to the point where we feel as if we are um, um, chilling each other's creativity, then we're crossing into a challenging space. And NRI, um, is challenged. They could do, it's not that they're not doing a lot with what they have, it's that we all can feel the potential that they could do a lot more if they had a lot more. And so over time, we have been increasing their budget internally, um, just not as quickly or as robustly as they would like for obvious reasons, because we're trying to be circumspect and constrained in how we allocate our resources. But um, a combination of incremental improvement with the general budget, state specials, and the support of the strategic plan, I think will get us where we want to go eventually. Thank Representative you, no Sandstead. Thank you, no follow up. Thank you, I have a next Representative Mecklen and then Representative Cleveland on deck. Representative Mecklen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question for President Gable. Um, and really what it comes down to is, what I'd like to know is what is the amount of the preserve What's the amount of money in the preserve account as well as in, in the endowment account that we that, that there's current mm -hmm. the U of M is currently sitting on? Well, well, because we're talking about a budget is really what we're talking about. So, if, if you if, if if she could help uh, us this with with that, that that may be helpful. President Gable, um, Chair Bernardi, Representative Mecklen, I'm going to let Julie give the dollar amounts and then. I'll take the follow-up questions that I assume are coming. <laughs> Ms. Tonneson. Bernardi, uh, representatives, the when you say the reserve account, we have a, I believe what you might mean is we have a board guided central reserve uh, that we are, that we budget for and plan for each year. And it is supposed to be $25 million or 4% of the state appropriation. That, that is what we strive for in that particular reserve account. But it is also there to help us in times of financial difficulty. And we are in that right now. And so we have spent some of that down because of the pandemic. And so we are looking at somewhere in the probably 10 to $15 million range in that central reserve uh, by the end of this year, hopefully. Uh, could be slightly less than that uh, before we're done. In terms of the endowment, uh, keep in mind that 99% uh, of our endowment or 98% of our endowment is restricted and cannot be spent uh, for, for general operations. 
the, the principle of the endowment remains in, intact and we take earnings from it that are about 170 to 180 million dollars per year that goes to very restricted activities within the institution based on the wishes of the donors. And so those funds go to fund primarily scholarships and faculty chairs or faculty salaries in specified areas of the university. Um, I hope that answers your question. If you have something more specific, I'd be happy to try to answer. Representative Eklund. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I would just like to actually know what the total dollar amount is, what's sitting in, the, in, the, in these two accounts currently. Ms. Tonneson. Okay, uh, Chair Bernardi, the, as I said, the Central Reserve account day-to-day uh, -day is almost impossible to know, but we are projecting it to be in the 10 to $15 million range uh, at the end of the fiscal year. The endowment overall is sitting right at about $4 four billion dollars uh, that's between the university endowment and the university of minnesota foundation endowment managed uh, piece so both of them together would be four billion and that is what is generating that 170 to 180 million dollars of annual earnings that comes into the institution representative mecklen do you have a follow-up question you know, I, I think I actually have my answer. I appreciate that, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Cleveborn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I would just like to quickly follow up to make sure that I'm clear about uh, what Ms. Tonneson just said. Um, so when, an, when money comes into the endowment, I, Representative Cleveborn, let's say, want to donate a million dollars to the University of Minnesota. I could say to the University of Minnesota, here's my million dollars, but you can only spend $5,000 per year for a student by the name of Cleborn to attend the agricultural school. Is that what she's saying by restricted monies? President Gable. Uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative Cleborn, yes. We cannot, the, we are so grateful for our donors. They make certain things possible that we could not do but we cannot spend that money on anything other than what they gave it to us for and follow their instructions. So uh, yes, you are absolutely correct. All right, thank you. I just wanna make sure that that was really clear for the new members as well as for myself. Um, the other- Representative Cleveborn. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question, um, because the issues of cost um, came up, how much of your budget is used or the medical school, let's say. But the other side of that equation, I always like to look at both the costs and the benefits. So um, when we're thinking about the benefits that come into the university from the medical school, how much money does the medical school generate in grants and research dollars? President Gable. Uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative Cleborn, I'm going to let Julie go into the detail, but I want to sort of paint a three-dimensional picture of what the medical school does. So first of all, they train probably every doctor you saw, um, both in their medical education and in what we call their DME, their graduate medical education. They um, discovered, they were the first to discover the low-cost ventilator, the co-venter, they are part of one of the vaccine studies. They have 20 clinical trials specifically related to the pandemic. It's the same faculty who are doing that. They treated 3,600 patients. They've tested a million people. So that's what our medical school does. Uh, and without it, we would have none of those things. There is no alternative. Um, so we invest in them, but they yield for us financially, which uh, Julie Tonneson will describe. But in our quality of life, when we say we're a health state here, and all in every single county, it's the University of Minnesota Medical School. If I may defer uh, my, the rest of the response to Julie Tonneson, Madam Chair. Ms. Tonneson. Chair Bernardi, Representative uh, Cleborn, the medical school in FY20, I'm just looking at my, my information over here. In FY20, their actual generated re total revenues between state and generated revenues was $761 million. That's roughly one, as the president mentioned earlier, that's roughly one sixth of university of the university's budget. Within that 761 million, half of roughly half of it or slightly more is related to uh, grants 
that uh, uh, produce research. So it's sponsored grants uh, from the federal government, largely from NIH, from foundations, from um, other places. About 150 million of it was state dollars between the O&M portion that they get and the state specials that they get. It's roughly $150 million of that. The tuition is actually a very small portion of their budget. Uh, that is, let me switch gears here really quick. The tuition that they generated last year was about $17.8 million. So it's, as you can see, it's a very small portion. Uh, and then they have the typical miscellaneous kind of sales income, clinical income that they generate through um, the arrangement with University of Minnesota Physicians. Uh, and, and we can get you the details if you want more specifics on the miscellaneous pieces. I don't have those right before me here, but those are the big categories of revenue that they generate. Representative Cleveland. Thank you, just one more question. Um, in the chart that you sent, and I'm very proud of the chart that you sent about how many um, member, how many students, alumni that live in each of our districts, right? Um, my district, Plymouth 44A, is very heavily represented by people who are attached to the University of Minnesota. And um, I thank you for producing such a wonderful brain trust for our community. But also, they give a lot back to the University of Minnesota. Um, could you speak just a little bit about what, uh, how the Alumni Association also reaches into the university, assists the university in creating those uh, extra dollars that help support some of the missions of the university? President Gable. Uh, Chair Bernardi, uh, Representative Cleborne, thank you for that question. And I wanna clarify based on an earlier question, the Alumni Association and the foundation are separate entities. Yes. Um, neither of them are involved in region selection. So uh, I wanna make sure that there's no confusion about that. Uh, that is something that the university is completely arm's length with and are, are honored and happy to be governed by who in your collective wisdom you select to govern the university. I wanna be crystal clear about that. Um, the Alumni Association uh, does engagement. They have chapters all over the country, um, some around the world. Uh, they run homecoming, they provide information, they're a source of mentorship, they help with employment opportunities for students, um, they collectively do engagement is what we would call that. The foundation, their partner institution, does the philanthropy and development that uh, leads to our very generous endowment. But what that endowment does is allow students who otherwise may not be able to afford to attend or who have unique merit come to and choose the University of Minnesota and then stay here and contribute to the economy. Um, our graduates contribute trillions of dollars a year into, or trillions of dollars into the Minnesota economy um, by living here, graduating from here and staying here and then being part of the job creation cycle that is so critical for us over time, but in particular as we recover from the pandemic. Uh, Representative Daniels. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, President Gable, for coming today and sharing with us your, uh, your thoughts and ideas and your uh, goals. Um, one, I kind of want to go backwards in time a little bit. And I know there were several uh, cuts to the uh, sports programs. And if you could just elaborate on that, and I did a little bit of reading on it, but elaborate how the decisions were made and what the uh, what the savings are, um, because I I was a little uh, confused uh, a little bit there about um, didn't seem like a real lot of savings for for so Scott. So if you could explain that, that'd be great. Thank you, President Gable. Yes, Chair Bernardi, uh, Representative Daniels. So we discontinued three sports a few months ago. Uh, that process is incredibly painful. Anything that we discontinue. Um, as a legacy institution with a lot of tradition is something we do um, as a last resort and um, with great reflection and sadness, frankly. Um, but the athletic department, like all of our auxiliary units and auxiliary units would be the units that generate their own revenue. So athletics, housing and dining, parking, we don't think about that much, but when no one's on campus, parking revenue is way down and these are expenses and, um, they come into the pandemic already with about a $4 million 
um, recurring shortfall um, in their budget, uh, the athletic department that is. And so um, as part of their need to resolve their um, pre-existing financial challenges that have been greatly exacerbated and, and catalyzed, unfortunately, by the pandemic, uh, which was originally expected to generate upwards of 70 or 80 million dollars of losses for the athletic department alone, um, that is slightly better by virtue of having played the reduced football season in the fall. But the testing program, the absence of other competitive sports has been incredibly expensive. Um, and to handle those financial challenges in ways that are compliant with Title IX, which is the federal law that um, mandates gender equity um, across the athletic department and across higher ed in general, but we hear about it most commonly with uh, athletics, um, led to the recommendation, as painful as it was, to discontinue those three sports. Those three sports alone save about a million and a half, a million point six recurring, but that needs to be taken in the overall context that if they stayed, those three sports, we would have to add additional sports and additional seats for women athletes, female athletes. So we were looking at having to increase the athletics budget by several million dollars in order to create compliance at a time when we needed to be finding savings across the institution and in particular in the auxiliary units. And so the savings on those sports alone is important. It's part of how they recover every bit of savings in, a, in an austerity time and a belt tightening time is relevant. But there's also the cost avoidance by virtue of those cancellations that we don't have to add the additional sports that we would have had to add in order to remain Title IX compliant. Representative Daniels, do you have a follow up? Uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Representative uh, Gable. Thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing me to, to uh, ask one little question. In, in your opinion, then, um, would these sports be brought back into uh, maybe two or three years down the road and the economy's back on its feet, or is there something that's off the table for good? President Gable. Um, Chair Bernardi, Representative Daniels, are the Administration's position is that these are these are. Did I freeze or did I did my answer come through? Uh, you yeah. would just want to. Did you did you hear that, Representative Daniels? The uh, chair, I'm sorry, I did freeze up. Just just okay. for a couple seconds. President Gable. Apologies. Uh, I, I thought we might make it through this whole, whole meeting without a Zoom issue, but no such luck. Um, the administration, uh, this is, these discontinuations, uh, Representative Daniels, have been approved by the board and the administration considers them permanent. Thank you. Um, Representative Daniel, Daniels, follow up? No, that's good. Thank you, okay. President Gable. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you. We are now at the close. We have three minutes left for represented, I mean, for President Gable to wrap up. President Gable, um, we have, uh, I see we have Representative uh, Mecklen. Did you have a quick question that could be done in a minute? I would let you do it with a response. Uh, I'm actually going to throw uh, to President Gable uh, kind of a, a softball. Um, looking behind her at the trim work that's above her head with the, 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 the dental work and the crown molding. We need more trade people that can do this kind of work uh, because it's actually beautiful that I see above her head. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rep I mean, President Gable, if you'd like to um, wrap up with your closing remarks, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Chair Bernardi, and thank you, Representative Meckland. It is beautiful, and we agree the spectrum of higher ed opportunities should be available for all students, and all students should be able to study and pursue what they consider would make them their best self. We have a shared mission and commitment to that. What the university does is contribute in a very specific part of that spectrum, the types of professions and opportunities for an educated workforce, for the jobs that create new jobs, for the work that creates new work, and also at the graduate and professional level for the faculty who teach all of the students 
both in the four-year institutions and in the technical schools and community colleges. So we think we all have a role to play in making individual Minnesotans have the most opportunity and the state of Minnesota have its best opportunities. So we're very grateful for the opportunity to present to you today, for the opportunity to speak on behalf of our 70,000 students and our uh, faculty and staff on all of our campuses and all of our extension offices, all of our clinicians and everyone who calls the University of Minnesota home. We have a shared commitment to the state for those students, for the research and discovery, for the mentor sections and what that means all across the state and to do those things in an inclusive and fiscally responsible way. Um, so we look forward to working with you throughout the session and taking your questions, offering you feedback and details as you make the tough decisions and we're very grateful for your willingness to do so. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you and I wanna thank you and the students today and I wanna thank you for your leadership during this very challenging time and for all the staff and the students for their innovation, for all the teaching and learning that's done and for all the engagement across the state of Minnesota. So thank you very much. With that members, uh, we will be having Minnesota State tomorrow. Get ready for your questions and uh, we look forward to seeing you. The meeting is adjourned.